Good morning. Today's uh, scripture reading is taken from Romans chapter 4, 18 through 25. In hope against hope we believed, so that I might become a father of many nations according to that which had been spoken. So shall your dependence be. Without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body, now as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old, and the deadness of Sarah's womb. Yet, with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully assured that what God had promised, he was able also to perform. Therefore, it was also credited to him as righteousness. Now for his sake only was it written that it was credited to him, but for our sakes also, to whom it will be credited, as those who believe in him who raised Jesus, our Lord, from the dead, he who was delivered over because of our transgressions and was raised because of our justification. Amen. Thank you. for that scripture reading from Romans chapter 4. I want to take us back to the beginning. And in the beginning, we understand that God created man in his own image. And it's tempting to say something went wrong. But it didn't go wrong. It's part of God's plan. But as we look, Adam and Eve fall away. And as we look, wickedness increases on the face of the earth. And as we look, we see wickedness amongst mankind today. And as we look, we can see our own faults and our own ungodliness. And so, it's not that something went wrong, it's maybe that God is still working on us. Maybe that's the, the valid way to, to think about it. And God, in Genesis 1, creates man in the image of God, male and female, creates he them. And how do we get there? In God's plan, what God says he will do. So he will accomplish creating us in his image somehow. And that means in holiness and purity. And somehow a man or mankind in God's image is one that will always choose right and good over evil, somehow that has to come to fruition in Christ Jesus. It all points to Christ. But in the meantime, let's look at God's plan, and let's, we ought to be able to look back and see God's heart and God's power working His plan, and we ought to find encouragement in that. We ought to find motivation to cooperate with God. The intensity, intensity, the intention and the sincerity of God's plan can be seen biblically. As we look through salvation history in the Old Testament, we ought to be able to see some of God's plan being implemented and put to work. You know, how, how are these mysteries of God in his plan for us to be in his image? How is that being worked out? And I would assert that as we look, one of the big things that we can see is that God is leading through history and directing and urging men and mankind to commit. And he does this through the use of great promises. We ought to be able to see those promises and the fulfillment and the outworking of those promises. And in those promises, we ought to be encouraged as we see God's great intentions so a verse from Ephesians 2, remember that 
you were at that time, in other words, before these Gentile nations, these non-Jewish nations, before they came to Christ, is what Paul is saying in Ephesians chapter 2, remember that you were at that time separate from Christ, excluded from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Strangers to the covenants, plural. What are all those covenants? Well, I don't think we can enumerate all of them, but we ought to take a look at some of those covenants of promise. A covenant basically is an agreement. A covenant is an agreement. Here's something that's mutually beneficial. And so the two parties each work their part. They agree and they decide and they cooperate. And, uh, you know, somehow... Yeah, you got this pile of garbage you got to get removed, and so you say to this guy, I'll pay you so much a week if you'll come by with your truck, and you form a covenant. You, you, you know, here's a contract, here's an agreement, and, and both of you benefit from it. That's one kind of a contract. But biblically, in God's case, God doesn't need anything. He doesn't need anything done. It's a one-sided offer. Might still be mutually... Uh, desirable somehow. But basically what we have in the Bible is a kind of a covenant where God says, I see that you need this. Here's what I'm going to do. And hence a promise, okay? This kind of covenant is a, is a promise, basically. Uh, and here's what I am willing to do. Here's what I'm going to do. And all you got to do is cooperate. I'm going to help you. Here's a covenant of promise. And so we see a covenant with Noah back in Genesis 8. God says, I will never again curse the ground on account of man. For the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth. And I will never again destroy every living thing as I have done. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. What's this? This is a promise from God. This is a promise saying, you know, if mankind is, the, the intentions of his heart are evil from youth. And, and uh, there's, there's a, there's a, 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 it'd be right if I just wiped them out. But you know what? I have plans for mankind. I'm going to work with mankind. I'm not going to wipe them out because of who I am, because of what I am. Here's a covenant that I'm going to make with Noah. And not just Noah, because Noah is mankind. Everybody else is gone, except Noah and his progeny, right, and their wives. And, uh, so Noah is mankind. So essentially that's a covenant of a promise to mankind. And we can go down a little bit and see how that's extended to all flesh with a rainbow. You know, after the flood, God sets up a rainbow, and that rainbow is still here, and that's pretty cool. Genesis 9, God says, I set my bow in the cloud. It shall be for a sign of a covenant between me and the earth. It shall come about when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow, which is seen in the cloud, will be seen in the cloud, and I will remember my covenant, could read my promise which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh. And never again shall the water become a flood to destroy all flesh. When the bow is in the cloud, then I will look upon it and remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that's on the earth. And God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth, you know, because of who God is. He sets his rainbow in the clouds, and he determines to nurture mankind and work with mankind, and not just mankind, because somehow, some way, the rest of the planet's hooked into that. All flesh. And then we look down a little bit farther, and we see another covenant of promise with Abraham. Genesis chapter 12. Now the Lord said to Abram, go forth from your country and from your relatives 
from your father's house to the land which I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great, and so you shall be a blessing, and I will curse those who, excuse me, and I, I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and in you all the families of earth will be blessed. Somehow we need to see there God's choice, God's intention, God's love, God's purpose, not under compulsion, not because he had to, but because he wanted to make such an offer, such a promise to bless Abraham and through Abraham all mankind. This ultimately follows genealogically throughout the Old Testament and into the New Testament to be fulfilled in Christ Jesus. This very promise, this covenant of promise is fulfilled in Christ, the new covenant, the Christian covenant, which is offered to us. Covenant of promise. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. God didn't have to do that. It's the nature of who he is. And here is that covenant of promise extended to us, which is fulfilled in Christ Jesus. Now these covenants, or you could say these promises, they highlight God's intention. And as you work through them, you see God's purpose and his plan being worked out the nature of the covenants is that God does not have to do these things. He extends these offers out of his nature, out of love, out of concern, out of care and consideration and nurture. God wants to work with mankind. And all these covenants, they are God-initiated and they are God-extended for our benefit. They're there because God is doing something and doing something beneficial for us and God expects that we will accept his transforming love. The end result will be man in the very image of God. You know what it requires? Covenant of promise, it requires trust. It requires that we believe, that we trust in Him. You know, there's nothing that we can do to earn our salvation. There's nothing we can do to deserve to be saved. There's nothing we can do that warrants this help. But then again, as is commonly verbalized, I would suggest it's an error to say there's nothing for us to do. There's nothing you can do to earn it, but to say you don't have to do anything, that's not really accurate. There's nothing you have to do except believe. Well, isn't that something you got to do? There's nothing for you to do at all except trust. That's something you got to do. There's nothing you need to do except Accept his lordship in your life. That's a pretty powerful thing that you do need to do. Respond and do what he says out of trust. That's a requirement. In the new covenant that's extended to us, we are saved by faith. Faith is the requirement. Faith is trust. This is our part in the covenant. God says, I'll do this if you trust me. And so as we trust, we follow and we do what he tells us to do. And such trust, such faith leads to actions on our part and endurance. And it leads to changes within us. It leads to spiritual development that works to transform us into the very image of God, into the very nature of his son. And so God is creating man in his own image, you see and that through Christ Jesus. God works at building our trust, and he does this in a number of ways as well. We spoke this morning at standing in, in the awe of God just by looking off at the Milky Way and, and just being amazed and moved towards him that way. 
But I would suggest as we read through this Old Testament, Genesis through Malachi, and we see the workings of God in this salvation history, we ought to see that God is helping us come to trust Him and be transformed to His image by providing us with many great faith builders. We're saved by faith. How do I come to faith? Well, I would assert that one of the things we learn here is that God is building faith within men through trials. Trials and tribulations. James 1, verse 12. Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial, for once he has been approved, continues to choose what's right and good, trust God, you see. Once he's approved, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised, covenanted, promised to those who love him. Now, God provides hard times. He allows folks to go through trials and tribulations and difficulties, and he rescues if folks trust him so that they do what he says. So consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect. That perfect means mature, means you've become what you need to become. Perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. And the first thing he does as we read salvation history is he picks Abraham. Abraham is a nobody from nowhere. Asks him, tells him, leave home. You leave home and I'll make you the father of many nations. You go where I tell you and I'll bless you and I'll bring forth kings and nations from you. You who are already well beyond childbearing age. So Abraham trusted and Abraham went. And Abraham did what God said do and went where God said go. And incidentally, as you read that salvation history, Old Testament, you see that Abraham didn't always do it very well. He didn't do it perfectly. He made mistakes. He exhibited flaws. But God is working on him, you see. He tried. You know, the promise comes to Abraham when he's about age 75. And that promise to Abraham, through your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed, that promise is not fulfilled until he's 100 years old. Folks, that's 25 years. What would you be thinking? God promises you a child. 25 years later, you're thinking, where is he? Is there a God? Is there no God? Is God incompetent? Is God incapable? Uh, Did God forget me? Did God go off someplace? What's going through your mind, all these doubts you see? And I would suggest that God is still developing faith and trust on the part of Abraham. And sometimes maybe God works most effectively in us when it feels like he's absent. Where is he? What's he doing? Well, I don't know. I don't understand but I'm going to bear with it and I'm going to choose righteousness and follow faithfully even though I can't see him at work at the moment. And that requires trust. So perhaps that time element, that waiting on the Lord, is one of the most difficult trials that we have to go through because patient endurance, that faithfulness, that integrity, that's a God quality. And frankly, that's kind of hard for most of us. Anybody can wait a few minutes for something. Anybody can put up with pain for 15 seconds. Anybody can have hope and great expectation for 10 minutes. But can you have that kind of faith and confident hope and expectation for 15 years? Or 25 years? Or 2,000 years? As you're waiting for the Messiah to come? You know, how is your trust in God in the long run? Are you set and determined and committed to wait for God to act? Can you wait for your reward and suffer and endure patiently in the meantime? 
Will you wait even if the rescue doesn't come until it seems like it's way too late? Where's your trust? Are you really a faithful child made over in the image of God? Where does your faithfulness need to grow? And what will grow that faithfulness? You know, our own development, spiritual development, Christ-likeness, godliness, it often comes through our trials. And so Romans 5, we also exalt in our tribulations. Go through your mind and your heart and ask what those tribulations are and have been for you. We exalt in our tribulations knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance. And perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. Isn't that that Holy Spirit right there? Isn't that being transformed into the image of God? Because I've had this spirit within me, this attitude, this life force, which is not exactly what it ought to be. It's not in the image of God, but now here comes the opportunity to have the very Spirit of God be the Spirit within me, that indwelling. Can you see the power of God at work in your life, especially during the hard times? Do you know that God is working on you, transforming you into the image of His Son? You know, well, we got problems, though. So how do I overcome these sin problems? Will I work it out like Sarah and Abraham? And I would scratch your head and see, uh, God hadn't got it figured out yet, so I'm going to uh, give Abraham Hagar and would do it our way. Or are you ready to wait and wait and wait and endure and let God do it the right way, His way? We have a prayer, the Lord's Prayer, in which we say, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. You know, if we're going to pray, lead us not into temptation, we ought not run into temptation. If we're going to pray, lead us not into temptation, we need to apply ourselves to avoid that temptation. James 1.13, let no one say when he is tempted, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he's carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin. When sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. You know, it sounds kind of parallel there of uh, eating that forbidden fruit and being excluded from the garden and excluded from the tree of life. We can create a lot of those temptations ourselves. Things like fear and doubt and lust and impatience. And we generate a lot of them by our own manner of thinking. 1 John 2.15 Do not love the world, nor the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away and also its lust, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. We need to understand the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life. These are not things that stand in the image of God. We've got to get rid of those things somehow. We have to struggle with them and eliminate them as we grow into God-likeness. You know, there's also a tendency maybe to manipulate God's Word, to manipulate God's intentions, and to do those things ourselves, to outguess God, to manipulate God, to manipulate His Word. And so the challenge comes for us to abide by Christ's Spirit and hold intently and intensively to the Word of God. God builds faith through those trials and temptations, but God also builds faith through the impossible. He accomplishes the impossible. He uses the unreasonable. He does things that we think are often in the most unlikely ways. He picks Abraham and Sarah. They're childless. 
And they're given a miraculous birth when Abraham's 100 years old. Do you know anybody that old? Do you know anybody pregnant that's 100 years old? Or 100 years old that's pregnant? That just, I mean, that's impossible. That's not reasonable even to think about. And then to go beyond that, and, and uh, I mean, finally a, mir- a miracle, a God working, and we give Abraham and Sarah a child, we turn around and we say, okay, now sacrifice that child on the altar. How unreasonable can you get? Or maybe David and Goliath. We're going to rescue the nation Israel from this giant, excellent, trained warrior with a little shepherd boy and a stone. That's unreasonable. That's impossible. But God does it. And he does that sort of thing repeatedly over and over again. Why? To build faith within us. You know, here comes Gideon. And uh, God finds Gideon tramping out grapes, you know, in in, in the wine press. And he calls to Gideon and tells him to go and, and rescue the nation. And Gideon says, Lord, how shall I deliver Israel? Behold, my family is the least in all of Manasseh, and I'm the youngest in my father's house. I'm a nobody. How can I accomplish such things? Or maybe the biggest one is the ultimate victory over Satan and sin and death by having the Son of God crucified on a cross. Who would think of such things as that? And God does all those things so that the surpassing greatness of the power will be seen to be of God and not from humans, because it is from God, working on humans and with humans. Isaiah 55, God teaches, My thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, my thoughts than your thoughts. You know, we look around the world and we see Christianity being trod upon. Christianity appears in so many ways to be in a hopeless situation in our nation today, and maybe across the planet. But it can be a very exciting thing to look at if you trust God's wisdom and God's power, and if you're expecting God ultimately to act and to win. What will God do here that will astound us and amaze us as we trust Him and do what He says do even through the trials and tribulations, are you ready to hope against hope? Are you ready to expect God to work when it seems like things are impossible? Are you willing to adjust your thinking in order to accept things the way God thinks rather than the way the world thinks and you would naturally expect things? Can you trust the power of the resurrection? Can you trust that power of to work in renewing you and standing you again, a new creature remade in the image of God. Can you accept God's plan effected over centuries to redeem you by the blood of Christ and transform you to the image of God? Are you ready, open, and willing for God to work on you in impossible ways beyond your imagination? Are you receptive to God's working out what he has already promised you he will do. Do you trust that God can change even you into the likeness and the very image of God? Trust God to fulfill his promises and follow him in whatever he says. That's our role. Would you pray with me? Holy Father, We stand amazed as we read salvation history. Father, increase our trust. Enable us to stand firm. Transform us to the very image of God in Christ. Dwell within us in your spirit that we can, like God, always choose what is right and holy and just. Help us to be completed in the image of Christ. And we ask these things in his name. Amen. I hope the message is an encouragement this morning.
I hope you stand amazed as you see the power of God at work in our lives. I hope you'll open your eyes and see that power at work. And somehow, one of the ways God works is through the body, through people, touching people, Christ living in people that can touch people. And so that is our role as a body of Christ, is to be an encouragement to you. If you've got a struggle going on, if you're struggling with walking in the image of God, let us help, let us pray together. If you have not made that appeal to God for Him to be your Lord, if you've not made that appeal in the waters of baptism, now is the time to do that as well. Through the power of the resurrection, become a child of God, become a child of that covenant promise. Now is the time while we close with a song. Thank you.